I'll make this uh, as short as I can, not too technical. Um, even though there's some game theory in the paper, I'll uh, avoid most of that discussion. Um, that work is still in progress, actually. We've extended the model uh, quite significantly. And i um, very encouraged, and I'll tell you why as I, as I go through it. Um, as an economist doing public policy, and I was a PhD student at Auburn University where we had a very strong interest in regulation and public choice, and, uh, the economic theories of regulation. And you learn those theories of regulation, and, and they basically come in two forms. Uh, the first is what we call capture theory, and that is where the regulated firm basically captures the regulator, and the regulator becomes basically a passive agent of the regulated firm. And this comes out of the uh, student's famous paper on regulation. So you have a basically powerful firm, regulated firm, and a passive regu uh, regulator in this relationship. The other theory is sort of the opposite, which is the original theory of regulation. We have sort of a command and control model where you have the all-powerful regulator who imposes regulation on the firm, and the firm is the passive recipient of the regulation. So you price the average cost, and the firm says, okay. Uh, you provide this level of quality, and the firm says, well, okay, you whatever you want. And so you had in those models sort of a powerful agent on one side, and then a passive agent on the other. And that's pretty much how it all worked in the economics. And then, you, then I come to the FCC and I watch how it works and I think, well, you know, I see a lot of evidence of capture theory. In fact, I remember Reed Hunt had a contest, some of you remember this here, um, where he came up with a, a different name for FCC, different, use the FCC acronym for something else. And one that one, one was fax, cut, copy, or something like that. But it's was changing the change. Uh, yeah, change and change. And I, I submitted the Frequently Captured Commission. Uh, it did not win. So obviously I, I saw plenty um, of evidence of that. And I, think, I think many people who studied the history of the FCC would conclude that the broadcast industry probably captured the FCC's media bureau. Uh, on the other hand, you do see elements of command and control as well. The regulators sort of force the firms into these boxes that they want to be in. Uh, and the firm appears partly to be passive recipient, but never quite like that. And I thought this, you know, you see elements of it, but it really didn't, wasn't very satisfying that it worked that way. Um, I had a conversation not that long ago, and you know, you see these things in practice. We, we all see these things in practice, and we're just so used to. Sometimes you don't notice it. It's like your kids, you know, the babies, and the next thing you know, they're grown up, you see them every day, and you just don't even notice that they've grown up. Um, even sometimes when I go away, go away for 10 days on business and I come home, you, you look at your children differently, just being a part of that a little bit. But I had a conversation with a uh, telecom executive not that long ago, and we were talking about the clearing the decks. And this is a phrase used in the industry. Um, and what clearing the decks means is if you have a merger, if you want to do a merger and the FCC has to approve the license transfer, then you've got to take all your baggage that's sitting around. Maybe there's an enforcement issue, maybe you've got an antitrust case against some small firm, or maybe you're not paying somebody or something, and you've got to get all that cleared up before you go in to get your merger approved. We call that clearing the debts. Um, we've heard other terms used, regulatory shakedown. It's one I've heard a lot, um, dating back to the AT&T uh, petition of approval, uh, where the FCC shook down AT&T for some low income, low volume uh, conditions. That's in the paper, if you want to read about that. Um, pay the dig is one I've heard before. You know, if you want something done at the FCC, you've got to pay the dig. If you want your spectrum set aside in the spectrum auction, you've got to sign up for network neutrality reclassification, for example. Um, those sorts of things. Um, and just extortion. You, know, you hear that word as well. Um, and and it, 
it may not be exactly like extortion, but it, it, it looks like it a lot of times. And all this comes out of, of well, the best case is the license transfer, which is the emergent situation. Because there you got a guy who really needs something done. He's got to get your approval. And sort of, you're going to get it. And you see in the merger conditions, and we cover this in depth in the paper, some of them, but we're, if you know anything about telecom, you're very familiar with these things. Um, so, if someone, someone says, well, think about this, and what would an economist, how would economists think about this, this issue? And so we put that to task with uh, Randy Beard and Michael Stern at Auburn, who I work with regularly, and brilliant economists, both of them. Uh, much better than I am. Um, and so we asked, what's the nature of this problem? How is it different than what we looked at in the past? How could we explain this technically, how this goes down and why it goes down? Um, why why might it happen? What what incentive would there be to bundle things like that, to uh, impose these conditions? And we call it, we call it issue bundling, which is combining multiple things together and doing a grand bargain over those things. And what are the consequences of that? And when you think about this, um, it, it changed our mentality about the way we look at regulation, at least for us. We said, well, this really isn't a passive regulated firm and a commanding regulator or a captured passive regulator and a commanding firm regulated firm. What we really have is power on both sides. And both sides need something. Both sides want something. And they come together and they make a bargain. Okay. And the economics would call that a non-cooperative bargain. Or a co cooperative bargain. They're also non-cooperative bargains. But this is a cooperative bargain. In some cases it can be non-cooperative, which is one thing we're looking at in addition. So this changes the way, really, that economics studies the issue of regulation. We presented this paper at the American Economic Association Convention last January, and we got very good reviews by people who were saying, you know, this is a different way, a better way to look at the way regulation really looks, not to mention all the extensions, theoretical extensions that are possible. Why do certain things get bundled and certain things don't? I mean, all, what is the sequence of events and how things get bundled? Um, I'm not going to go in depth into the game theoretical model. Um, you basically have, uh, it's very simple, you have uh, two uh, issues, the regulator and the regulator firm have a couple of issues, and you compute the equilibrium if they're separate, and you compute the equilibrium if they're joined, and you see how it differs. And, and the, what's interesting about exercises like that is you have to start thinking about why might the joint bargain be different than the separate bargain. That's basically theoretically what you're looking for. And it turns out to be a very simple case, and that is that, that one party needs to have a nonlinear payoff function. Okay. Um, and basically what that means is, is that in, in the linear payoff function, the firm, for example, is interested in profits. And profits are, 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 have a linear relationship. You know, if, if you take a dollar from me, you're taking a dollar from me. The government is a little different. The regulators are a little different. Uh, for one thing, consumer surplus, which is the value that consumers will get from a product's consumption, is not linear in profits. Okay, so you already have a nonlinear introduced there for the regulators looking at consumer surplus. But also there are things like universal deployment of broadband, things like that, where maybe maybe I'll give up something a little of something to gain a lot of something else. Okay? So the trade-off is not one for one. It's either I may gain a lot by giving up a little, or I may uh, lose a little by gaining a lot. Okay? So that's basically how it works. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the case of one's one economy or the other's not. It kind of depends on the relative shape. But I think the stronger case is that the government would have a lot of payoff function because of the social issues and all the other things. It's interested in firms making this profit, we don't have a lot of problem thinking along those lines. And if that's true, what happens is, is that the guy who has the nonlinear piece is handicapped in the separate part. Okay? He, he has to give up something because of his nonlinear preferences. 
by joining the two issues, he can get that back. Okay? So basically, by joining issues, the power lost in my nonlinear preferences is regained. Okay? That's essentially how the model works. And, and what, that told, what that tells us is that the person who wants to do the bundling is primarily the regulator. And the regulator wants to do the bundling because he can increase his payoff relative to the other part. In the front part. It could go the other way. You know, if you turn the nonlinearity on the other side, it could be the other way. And I think there are probably some cases where a, I mean, if, say for example, you had a merger that was widely held to be bad for consumers and lots of things. And so you come in and you say, okay, you don't say this, but you know what you're thinking. This merger's not really all that good, but I tell you what I'll do. I'll do this. I'll wire, I'll get broadband for people, or wire our schools, or whatever, right? So you basically do a payoff of some sort to try to get something through that would otherwise not go through. The but for merger test, which is started with the Verizon, Bell Atlantic, and I the FCC started saying, this merger stinks, but if I can add this in there, it doesn't stink nearly as bad. It might actually smell neutral or sweet. Uh, wasn't it Bell Atlantic 9 Yep. Yeah. Um, you would know. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's how it works. Now, what are the implications? I think the implications are probably more interesting to this crowd than theory, um, which is hardly interesting to me. Um, Two elements uh, that are worse. One is it weakens precedent. Okay. Regulation is done by precedent. And I learned this from my, my excellent legal friends when I joined the FCC. I was a young economist and I probably thought a lot like the uh, leadership of the FCC today. Is, uh, oh, well, let's just do what we want to do. We can get real cute and come up with an argument. Um, and I was uh, strongly uh, berated by my colleagues and taught that no, in the practice of law, precedent matters, the law matters, and there's the way to do this right. And I learned that lesson. But now what you have, in the old days, you could, in some cases, you could look at an order or a series of decisions and say, okay, this is how this goes down, right? If we need uh, less than a 50% market share, we need to have so many guys in this many central offices, or whatever the heck it was, and you know, it's okay, I've kind of got everything in a row here, I'll get, it, I'll get this done. Um, it may be a little difficult at times, but that, this is the precedent that you look. Well, when you have a bundle of issues, then individual components of the decision don't tell you anything. Okay. How is it that a firm can say, well, this is what I need for forbearance, if the forbearance decision is not about competition, but is tied somehow to what I'm going to do for well, we have so every regulatory decision becomes this uh, uh, suitcase of components uh, that no other firm can put together in the same way so that the precedent works. Okay? So you basically have this loss of precedent. Now, precedent has lost a lot of power anyway, not necessarily because of the bundling issue, but because you can discard it in a footnote nowadays, apparently. Um, but that's one consequence of bundling issues, is that, is that there is no, there's no precedent, there's no pattern along a specific dimension that says, okay, this is how this works. Okay, this is how this works, if I do this, and if I do that, and if I do this. But if I can't do those two things, then I've got to come up with some other package, and I don't know how that's going to work. Um, and some of this stuff is not always in an explicit voluntary merger or explicit merger condition. Some of it just sort of happens off the books. Some agreement that doesn't really show up, which makes empirical work difficult. Um, and in some cases, like you know, we showed in the paper that in 75 percent of the largest mergers uh, the FCC reviewed in the past 10 years um, have had a uh, consent decree associated with them. So in those cases, they do show up, but a lot of times they don't. Settling the antitrust case, for example, doesn't show up in anybody's books. Uh, the other thing is, is that the, the regulator can now operate outside of its statutory uh, boundaries. Um, 
if a firm says, okay, I want this merger done, and to get this merger done, I will um, give low income people broadband and discount or whatever, I'll deploy this in schools, or I'll do this, that, or the other, and, and make contributions to the treasury, whatever the hell it is, um, and quite varied. Who is going to appeal that? Well, really, the only guy with any standing to appeal it is the guy who just agreed to do it. And he volunteered to do it. So there's nothing, there's no way you can go into a court and say, this is horrible. Okay, so even though the FCC has the authority to review license transfers and mergers, uh, it uses that authority then to do things it doesn't have the authority to do, okay. or may not have the authority to do, or it might be very difficult to do it through the normal channels, okay. and it might lose the case, for example. I mean, one of the merger conditions that appears a lot is, I will abide by these rules even if the court says they're unconstitutional or, or in violation of communication and things like that. So you, you get outside about them. We get outside the ability to, or outside statutory control. And now the FCC or any regulatory this isn't just the FCC, this would be any regulatory agency. Um, now is lift is free from the shackles of Congress. Okay, it can pretty much do whatever it wants to do, which is pretty significant, I think. Uh, and something probably uh, Congress ought to look at. But the papers on our website, if you'd like to look at them, have an extended version now, probably in December or January, um, if you're interested in the theory part of it. Um, but that's it. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. All right, let's get to the next panel. Let's do it.